So, so today we're going to uh, go over a Southwest MLS rules update. So just to kind of go over what we're going to be talking about today, uh, here's a rundown of what we're going to cover. We're going to start by talking about data integrity and why it's important. Uh, we're going to cover what I call the compliance trifecta, which is MLS rules, code of ethics, and broker duties, uh, what they are, who is in charge of them, how do they overlap, and most importantly, how do they affect you? Uh, we're, after that, we're going to talk about everybody's favorite topic, clear cooperation. But don't roll your eyes too hard. I actually have a bit of a new message for you. Uh, once we've laid the foundation with these first three topics, we're going to dig into the rules themselves, starting with the top most common violations and how to avoid them. And then we'll wrap up by going over some recent changes to the MLS rules and how those affect you. And wrap up with a peek at what you can expect to see coming soon. Um, so I've heard this rumor that realtors tend to be a little competitive. <laughs> so as we go through the presentation today, keep your phones handy. We're actually gonna be playing a game. Uh, each section will have three questions or actually four questions. And the faster you answer the questions, the more points you'll score. So make sure you're logged into your Wi-Fi on your phone or anything else you need to do to be ready. At the end of the class, the winner gets bragging rights and the undying adoration of everyone in the class. <laughs> you can even add quiz winner for Richard's Southwest MLS rules update class, to your business cards and email signatures. Uh, but you can go ahead and head to the link on, on the slide or scan the QR code. But if you miss it right now, don't worry, we're gonna move on, but you're gonna be provided the link and the QR code each time the game is here. So it's coming again in the future. Um, also quick note, not required for the CE. It's just a fun little thing we're doing. You don't have to do it. Uh, but I do recommend participating just to kind of stay engaged. Uh, and and if, you, if you do go ahead and log in now, you can actually go into your name and you can actually pick out a fun little emoji. So if you show up in the, on the leaderboard, you can pick which uh, emoji is showing up. So we're going to start off with the bedrock of the MLS, data integrity. The real power of the MLS is being a system that, that enforces uh, an agreed upon set of rules by brokers that participate within it. As a realtor in the United States, it's really easy to take the MLS for granted. After all, the concept of the MLS has been around for more than 100 years. Uh, even before computers and digitization of the MLS, the concept of cooperation among competitors for the greater good based upon an agreed upon set of rules existed during times of punch cards and books and note cards, all the way back to some brokers meeting around a table in a restaurant in the late 1800s. But did you know that the United States and Canada are the only countries in with, with an MLS ecosystem? What does the real estate market look like to the rest of these countries? In most countries, there's no single centralized source of homes. Have you tried finding a rental in Albuquerque recently? Your only option is to go to multiple different property manager websites and search their inventory or ask in the GAR members Facebook page or risk getting scammed on Facebook Marketplace or Craigslist. Imagine if the residential resale market was that way as well. That's what they deal with everywhere that isn't the United States or Canada. Because there isn't one single set of agreed upon rules and compliance to make sure listings are closed out, most of these websites have listings on them that may or may not still be for sale. What if you had to call the listing agent every single time you wanted to check and see if a listing was really available? Uh, the MLS has a built-in ecosystem where we syndicate data to our national portals. So consumers have the widest range of properties available for them to view. Anyone remember the Newsday investigation from 2019 called Long Island Divided that uncovered widespread steering in Long Island? Without the transparency and access of date to data provided, by, provided to consumers by the MLS, we're never able to uh, uncover those kind of issues. And of course, via compliance and members holding each other accountable, we're the trusted source of, of reliable property data. Also, without the MLS, nearly every deal is double-ended, but with, with the buyer never really getting their own professional representation unless they opt to pay for that out of pocket. Oftentimes, first home, uh, often first-time home buyers are the ones who need representation the most, but they're also the same ones that can't afford to pay for their own representation. Well, we'll of course talk more about clear, more clear cooperation later, but that rule provides equal opportunity for all homes for everyone. And the MLS makes it easy to find the broker selling a home as well. Finally, the MLS creates a level playing field between large and small brokerages. Without the MLS, to find homes, consumers simply visit the top largest brokerages because that's where they get the most exposure for their efforts, leaving smaller brokerages without inventory to sell and no buyer commission to participate in. 
So let's break the importance of data integrity down into three categories, marketing, valuation, and statistics. So the most obvious purpose of the MLS is to market your listings to, to other brokers and the public. This data needs to be correct so that anyone who has filters set would match, that would match your listings can find them and to cut down a number of phone calls you get asking to verify data that's on the listing. The data is also syndicated out to hundreds of websites across the internet, and you want to make sure consumers are able to find your listing. But MLS data, data goes far beyond just marketing. Remember, the MLS is not a marketing platform. It is a data platform that happens to have marketing as a portion of it. The next step is valuation. You got an accepted offer on your property. Great. You're now waiting on appraisal and you are entirely reliant on data that was entered uh, from comparable properties by members before you. Don't miss that. Listen again. You are entirely reliant on data that was entered on comparable properties by members before you. So the appraiser is going to try to pull comps on similar homes. If the listing has no photos of the interior, it's useless to them. If a listing doesn't have complete data about features of the home, it can skew valuation. If the listing has incorrect square footage data, it may not show up in their search or it creates more work for them to have to go track that information down. Have you, has anybody ever wondered why appraisers have such a bad taste in their mouth about realtors a lot of times? Imagine if every time you try to do your job, you had to spend 40% of your time filtering out junk that realtors had entered to get to the useful data that you need. As a realtor, when an appraiser sees your name on a listing, do they assume it's one they can probably use or one that they probably have to cut? Finally, we have market statistics. Data from MLS is aggregated into market statistics at the local, state, and national level with various government organizations to help make or to help those organizations make decisions to guide the real estate market. For example, the president of the United States of America gets a monthly report on, his, on the status of the real estate industry because real estate drives 15 to 20 percent of our gross domestic product and thus is a major driver of the economy. So um, real estate in the U.S. is a relatively accurate predictor of which direction the economy is going to go. So think about it. Right now, the Fed is raising interest rates to try to curb inflation. And part of that is a direct response to the crazy home market. If our, if our market statistics are showing that days on market was artificially low or that your sale price to listing price was artificially high, they could be raising interest rates for the wrong reason. Even at a local level, our market data is sent to state legislatures, mayors, and other commissions to help guide policy decisions here as well. If the data is incorrect or skewed, again, we could be causing the wrong decisions to be made. I use the example of a statue at a museum. One person touching the statue doesn't have much of an impact. But when people think, oh, I won't have that much of an impact, then over time, there can be a large and irreparable impact. Someone might think that bending to the wishes of their seller's wishes to manipulate days on market or changing the list price after an accepted offer isn't hurting anyone because it's just one listing, but it, but it is affecting the data. Every single listing that is wrong requires the data to, or, or causes the data to be off by just enough, and this adds up over time. We'll talk more about days on market manipulation a little later, but let me take a second and talk about changing the list price after accepting an offer for a moment. First, you aren't fooling anyone. <laughs> I've asked appraisers about this practice and they've told me two things. Number one, your list price isn't even considered as part of their valuation anyways. And number two, original list price is available right on the front of the listing and that's what they look for anyways. Seriously, the practice does absolutely nothing to help your chances at a higher appraisal, but it does affect statistics. All of the damage, none of the benefit. Please stop. <laughs> and if you know anybody else who does it, ask them to stop as well. Um, now, a, a quick road trip, something that does help your chances at a higher appraisal, complete and accurate information, including filling out fields that aren't mandatory. For example, the power production annual field that we added last year. It's an optional field, but if the home has solar and you complete that field, the appraiser can use that kilowatt hour energy generation to increase the value of your appraisal. Last year, Fannie and Freddie actually changed the rules so appraisers are no longer used to use, allowed to use things like the PV value tool to uh, estimate production. 
they must have the power production annual number in order to support the value. But don't worry, it's easy to find that data. This value was actually required by federal law to be provided in a tube close to the system's meter or inverter. On the screen here, we have a picture where it has a little arrow that says PPA info can be found here. That's what the tube looks like. And then you pull it out and there's the form. You can get that information off of the, uh, off that form. So just to recap, bad data can cause a wide range of headaches, headaches that you don't want. So don't make anyone else have those headaches either. Uh, so outdated status information, you have to call each other for updates and it's an inefficient use of time. And you have a bunch of upset customers when homes aren't available that they fall in love with. If there's no photos, appraisers are not able to use the data for valuation. Members cannot do CMAs. And then if you have inconsistent or unverified information, anyone trying to use the data has to do extra legwork to either correct it or cut it out. And then market statistics guides decisions that affect people's lives. Uh, so again, if bad data skews the results, leaders are not making the right decisions. So here's the deal. What you do matters. Every listing matters. It really boils down to focusing on what is best for the greater good uh, of all of the other members you cooperate with. When you need data for your customers, you want the data to be right. So when you're entering the data, make sure you're providing that same courtesy to others. It's the golden rule, right? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. All right, so now we're gonna see who's paying attention. Grab your phones and go to ahaslides.com slash swimless or scan the QR code and get ready to play. You'll go ahead and hop it over to the quiz for me, Gabe. There we go. All right, so we have the quiz on the screen now. I'm gonna give it a second, let everybody get logged in here. Uh, looks like we got about 45 joining already. Um, and then, you know, of course, throughout the, uh, throughout the time this quiz is going, you know, you guys have the likes and the loves and the, and the ha-has and the wows down there. Feel free to use those and just kind of let us know how it's going. But there's going to be six rounds total, one for each section of this class uh, with four questions in each section. There's going to be 30 seconds for each question to answer, and you answer it on your phone. Uh, and uh, faster answers do get more points. After each round, there will be a leaderboard shown at the end of each round. Uh, Jerry, if you didn't get the QR code, you can just go to aha slides slash SWMLS on your phone and it'll get, it'll get in there for you. As, as, if you, if you went to aha slides directly, the code is SWMLS. We'll give it another second here. We're crossing over a hundred. I'll let it get to about half and then we'll get started. Let's see, the number's kind of leveling out here. All right, so this first section is, uh, is, like, is data integrity. So it's going over the section we just covered. All right, we're gonna go get started here. All right, first question. The concept of the MLS began in the Is it the late 1800s, the early 1900s, the mid 1900s, or the late 1900s? Got 30 seconds to answer. I did try to get a decent mix of, uh, of you know, really having to pay attention questions and some a lot easier ones. So you guys have a pretty good mixture of them here. Once again, if you can't load the QR code, it's it's the it, the Websites at the top of the screen there, ahaslides.com slash swimless. The correct answer is the late 1800s. It was actually started in various bars and restaurants uh, in, in the Chicago area. It was where they first started talking about the concept of cooperation and uh, compensation. All right, question two. Choose all of the places that have an established MLS industry. You have the United States, Europe, Australia, Canada, and Mexico. Fifteen seconds left. And if you guys are having trouble, just just keep trying. It's, you know, there's quite a few people that are in, and it's working fine. So, just uh, keep giving it a shot, or just kind of keep up. 
All right, time's up. The answer is the United States and Canada. The MLS system does not exist in Europe, Australia, or Mexico. The, you know, that's, that's what we're going over. A lot of the different issues that they have there, uh, they experience those in all of those countries. All right, question three. True or false, taking all of the photos off of a listing after it has sold is not hurting anyone. True or false? And a little bit later on, when we talk about the, the new minimum photos rule, I'll go into some other options you have for sellers that ask you to do this. So there will be more options out there for you. 10 seconds left. Gloria, the code is SWMLS. Time's up. That is patently false. Thank you very much. The six of you who answered true, I'll be calling you later. <laughs> so next question, or last question for this section, which of the following is not a benefit of the MLS? Emphasis on not. Is it the having the largest database of available homes? Is it providing equal opportunity for all home buyers and sellers? Is it that the markets become controlled by large brokerages? Or is it the fact that we have verified, trusted, detailed, and accurate property information? 10 seconds left. And after this question, it is going to display the leaderboard. So we'll see who out there is really kicking butt for us. All right, not a benefit is the markets becoming large broker controlled. Very good. All right, let's take a look at the leaderboard here. Amy Jones is in the lead, followed up by B-Rad, Gene, How, Lexoid, and AJ. Let me see if it'll let me scroll down here and give us a couple more. So from the round out top 10, Jenna, Katie, Andrew, and Julie. All right, great job, y'all. So yeah, well, like I said, we'll keep coming back to that. Gabe, if you'll pop back over to the presentation for me. Uh, and well, like I said, each round, we're going to have more and more of that. So yeah, Amy Jones, I'll, uh, I might have to, uh, if you can hold on to the lead, maybe I'll print you a certificate and sign it and mail it to you or something. We'll, we'll do something, not money, but something. <laughs> All right. So next up, I want to talk about what we call the compliance trifecta. There are three different rule sets that a realtor has to follow, and it can be confusing which of these sets applies in any given situation. In fact, you probably feel a bit like Peter Gibbons from Office Space. He spells his name with an O, by the way. I spell mine with an E, so mine's correct. So you have the Code of Ethics from NAR. You have your own broker duties from the New Mexico Real Estate Commission. You have MLS rules, uh, plus you likely even have your own MLS policies, uh, or, or your own office policies, I mean. For being an independent contractor, you certainly have a lot of different people telling you what to do. Um, I've noticed a couple people saying, can you please share the presentation screen? We do have it up, so that might be a setting on your end. Um, not sure what's going on there because we have it on presentation mode. So you may need to like right click and choose pin screen or something like that. Uh, but yeah, you certainly have a lot of people telling you what to do. Well, we've got a couple of people saying it's not up, Gabe. You got any ideas what's going on there? Okay. All right. Gabe's going to handle that. So, but so the key to remember is that while each of the trifecta intersect, interacts and drives the others, they are still distinct and separate gears. Each of us plays our part in the industry, but we also operate together in very interconnected ways. Here's the best way to break it down. Broker duties deals with protecting the consumer. Things like advertising and disclosure. Following the New Mexico real estate rules book is how you earn and maintain your license. Code of Ethics deals with professionalism and a high standard of integrity. Pledging to the Code of Ethics is how you became a Realtor. MLS rules are an agreed upon set of rules for data integrity. This is how we all work together to create a common and efficient marketplace. The compliance and enforcement process is a little different for each one with varying levels of involvement. Starting with broker duties at the state level, the New Mexico Real Estate Commission has a duty to protect the public. They do that by ensuring that each New Mexico licensee follows their rule book. The rule book explains your broker duties, which can deal with protecting the consumer. The book is broken down into sections. You have broker duties, which covers reasonable care, disclosure, and advertising. You have legislative statutes and rules. The statutes are what make the rules enforceable. For issues involving a suspected violation of broker duties, mishandling funds, fraud, or consumer protection issues, 
you would report the issue to the New Mexico Real Estate Commission. You would do this by obtaining a complaint form the, from the commission and submitting it. It is then assigned to an investigator. Once the investigation is complete and the respondent has had an opportunity to respond in writing, a report is presented to the commissioners who will determine whether the complaint is dismissed or proceeds forward with disciplinary action against a licensee. It is to be noted that NMREC can only administratively enforce the license rules. What that means is if there's a monetary dispute between the member of the public and a licensee or a dispute between a buyer and a seller, the New Mexico Real Estate Commission cannot provide financial restitution. Next up is the code of ethics. Every realtor must take a code of ethics class every three years to ensure that you as a member have an understanding and working knowledge of what makes a realtor a realtor, your pledge to the code of ethics. For issues related to the 17 articles of the code of ethics, you would contact the professional standards team at GAR. This team handles a wider range of different options from informal conflict resolution to the formal education process. I'll briefly explain each one here but know that you don't have to be an expert. Your guard team already is, and they will help point you in the right direction. The Professional Standards Office offers mediation and ombudsman services. Depending on the outcome someone is looking for, these conflict resolution services might resolve a matter before it becomes a formal ethics complaint or a lawsuit. These voluntary programs can help people in dispute reach agreement with an impartial ombuds or mediator acting as a neutral facilitator to work towards a mutually acceptable solution. Each of these processes is a little different with ombuds being the less formal of the two. If anyone believes a realtor has violated the code of ethics, they can file a formal ethics complaint. An important thing to remember with an ethics complaint is that a hearing panel or a peer jury decides if the code was broken or not. Since the association does not investigate complaints like the NMREC, the ultimate burden of proof of a violation is always on the complainant. The best practice if you choose to go this route is to start by reviewing the code of ethics and the standard of practice. The standards of practice could support your citing of a specific article you believe was violated. If there isn't a specific standard, then the situation is likely better suited for other services mentioned here, like the mediation or ombudsman. Again, the professional standards team will be happy to help walk you through that. Finally, if your issue is about a money dispute based on a contract, arbitration services are available. Arbitration is designed to resolve disputes over who is entitled to the money, such as a commission like referral fees, procuring cause, etc. This process is started by a brokerage principal who is seeking compensation and submits a request to ar uh, a request in agreement to arbitrate form, say mouthful, along with a $250 fi filing fee. A properly filled out request would then go before the grievance committee to determine if it is an arbitrable matter. If so, it is forwarded to professional standards for an arbitration hearing. Since arbitration is a win-lose outcome because only one side gets the money, it is always recommended to try one of the other conflict resolution programs first. And then we have the MLS rules. Again, the purpose of the MLS rule, the purpose of the MLS is to manage compliance and data integrity within a set of agreed upon rules. Have I said that enough times yet? And everything that we do focuses solely on the data. Because our focus is on data in a clearly defined set of rules with very little gray area, the MLS compliance process is the easiest of the three. If an MLS rule is broken, we have an escalating fine process where fines are levied on a member and continue to escalate until the issue is resolved. Violations happen two different ways. We have systems in place for proactive enforcement that check every listing for potential violations for things that a computer can detect, such as dates being wrong, detecting discrepancies in selected options, or detecting the use of certain words. These systems are constantly being upgraded and improved over time. We also rely on reactive enforcement from members, some things such as clear cooperation or data that we cannot verify without physically visiting the property like you do, we rely on reports from the MLS members to report to us. So one very common issue we have is members confusing broker duties or code of ethics issues with MLS compliance. Because we have the easiest process of the three arms of this trifecta, 
Members report issues to us that should be handled by the other two entities, expecting the MLS to become investigator, judge, jury, and executioner for their issue. But that is beyond the scope of what we can do as the MLS. We have a very narrow lane with really only one side of the story, data driven by a clearly written rule. Issues involving broker duties or the code of ethics nearly always have multiple sides of the story and gray areas that need to be determined by a panel of some sort. And while Southwest MLS is the, a wholly owned subsidiary of GAR, we are still a separate entity and there are very clear lines driven between MLS compliance and professional standards. All this being said, going back to the gear analogy, all three of us do work hand in hand together quite often. If you're reporting something to the wrong entity, each one of us understands the other enough to help point you in the right direction. Just make sure you understand the differences and know that the process is a little different for each one so you know what to expect. One last thing to remember you may hear from any of the three of us. Not everything in real estate can be handled by the commission, the association, or the MLS. Sometimes situation involving contract law must be settled by getting attorneys involved and going to court. None of the three associations practice law, and all those services such as arbitration and mediation exist specifically to help lighten the load on the court system, sometimes it is, unfortunately, unavoidable. In those cases, of course, the law supersedes all three of us. All right, that was some heavy stuff in that section, right? Let's lighten it up a bit with another quiz. Go ahead and grab your phones and head over to ahaslides.com or scan the QR code and get ready to play. Hopefully those of you who had it before just left it there, but take a second to power up. Let's give it just a couple seconds if anybody wanted to try to grab the QR code who wasn't in last time. Give it about five more seconds. Three, two, one. Gabe, go ahead and pop over to the quiz for me. All right, round two, compliance trifecta. Looks like we still got 145 people on. Thank you all for participating. Hopefully this is fun for you and a little bit better than just listening to me drone on with slides. Question five, you are involved in a transaction with a suspected violation of broker duties. Which organization should you contact? The New Mexico Real Estate Commission, Southwest MLS, or the GAR Professional Standards Team? Suspected violation of broker duties. If you guys actually go on the NMREC website, there is a, they do have their uh, rule book posted on there. And that's a good one to check back on if you think some, if there is a suspected violation there. Five seconds left. Three, two, one. Correct answer is the New Mexico Real Estate Commission. Now, the 48 of you that did regard professional standards, that's okay. If you reported to them, they would point you in the right direction. So, you know, it's, it's always okay to start with the professional standards folks because they are the experts. Speaking of the experts, which of the following services are not offered by GAR professional standards? Is it arbitration, legal advice, mediation, or ombudsman? Which of the four is not offered by GAR professional standards team? I got 10 seconds. Three, two, one. And of course the answer is legal advice. We are not lawyers and I don't think we're interested in becoming them. <laughs> so good one there. All right, question seven. Which of the following issues should be reported to Southwest MLS? There's six total options, three of them are correct. So is it the broker didn't include their office name on their sign? Listing is being advertised, but it's not in the MLS, so clear cooperation. Escrow disputes between a buyer and a seller. Using your photos without your permission. A property is listed as a three-bedroom, but it's actually a two-bedroom. Or failure to return a deposit in a timely manner. Three of these are correct. So pick the right three. Time's up. All right, so it is the listing being advertised in the MLS, using photos of that by permission and listed as a three bedroom, but is actually a two bedroom. By the way, the questions that are like this that have multiple, you get more points if you get more correct. So if you only got two out of three, you still got some points there. So uh, just do the best you can on those ones. All right, last question for this section. 
True or false, Southwest MLS is responsible for issues related to member professionalism. True or false. Now, of course, you know, some things interact with professionalism. Like, you know, of course we want good data, right? But, you know, if, if, they, if you have an issue where somebody is not being a professional, should that be reported to Southwest MLS, true or false? Three, two, one. And that is false. Member professionalism is going to be either broker duties through the, through the commission or under the code of ethics with the uh, GAR professional standards team. All right, here's the leaderboard again. Look at that. Gene jumped up and let's do this. I love that name there. That's good stuff. Uh, Andrew, Terry, Jenny, Carrie, good job. Rounding out the top 10, Andrea, Susie, Sadie, and Mariah. All right, great job, everybody. we got some good, good scores going on here and going to uh, keep having some fun with this. All right, we're going to head to our next section. If you'll hop back over to the slides for me. Clear cooperation. This is one of my most and least favorite conversations. <laughs> so it's one of my most favorites. I'm, anybody who's known me for more than five seconds knows that I'm a huge fan of clear cooperation because it is pro-consumer pro-fair housing and has pro-competitive benefits that really drive the MLS forward. But it's also one of my least favorite conversation because we're now two years past this rule launching and I still routinely come across people who don't understand it. Let's simplify things and just get to the brass tacks, the core, the crux, the bottom line. I'm going to start with the basics. Um, so, so for anybody who's on this webinar who's been living under a rock for two years, the basics of clear operation is pretty simple. If you have a listing agreement on a property and it is advertised to the public, then it must be entered into the MLS within one business day. Clear cooperation is built on section 1.0 of the MLS rules. Only listings that are included in section 1.0 are governed by clear cooperation. In our case, commercial listings are not part of clear cooperation because they're not part of the mandatory submission policy. Only residential land and multifamily are part of that. Section 1.0 requires that all listings that a broker has a listing agreement on that reside within the service area must be submitted to the MLS within 48 hours. You can still set your on-market date up to one year out in the future, however, and the listing will not be visible to anyone except you and MLS staff until that date is reached. The public marketing piece of clear cooperation is a pretty clear with a very low bar. Any communication about the property that is made outside of the members and clients of your office is considered public marketing. And here's the real kicker. That can be triggered by anyone, not just the listing broker. If you have a listing agreement and your seller tells their book club that their house is for sale, that's public marketing. If you hire a photographer and they post pictures that they took of the home on Instagram, that's public marketing. Realtors are expected to remain in total control of all marketing of the property and need to have all the conversations to make sure that happens. Um, my clear cooperation video goes into a whole lot more detail about this. Um, Gabe, if you'll go ahead and drop that link in the chat for everybody. It's a YouTube video I did last year called Clear Cooperation, More Than Just a Rule to Follow. It goes into a whole lot more detail on this public marketing uh, piece. So definitely refer back to that if you have other questions. But if both of the things we've discussed here are true, you have a listing agreement and it's been publicly advertised, uh, the listing must be entered in MLS within one business day. So recently I've summed that up in one pretty succinct statement. And if you follow this statement, you can know you are always in compliance with clear cooperation. 100% of the time, take all the weird stuff, throw it out the window, 100% of the time. If it isn't in the MLS, don't advertise it. Don't talk about it. Just don't do it. If it's not in the MLS, don't talk about it. That's it, really. All of the other questions, all the what ifs, all the situations, the problems and the hubbub come from people trying to find ways around it. So I, I, I can hear all of you already, right? But Richard, what if my seller wants me to put a sign in the yard before their home is ready? But Richard, what if I'm selling my own home? But Richard, what if I don't have a listing agreement yet? But Richard, what about using the weekend for an open house and entering the listing on Monday? But, 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 just stop. <laughs> yes, the rule has problems. It has loopholes. 
there's plenty of things you can do within the rule. But as realtors, I believe you were held to a higher standard. And just because you can doesn't mean you should. <laughs> and let's talk about that. Have you ever read the preamble to the NAR Code of Ethics? If you haven't read that recently or ever, I recommend going back and reading it. It's not very long, but it really drives home the aspirational objectives of what it means to be a realtor. Look, I've drank the blue Kool-Aid. I believe in the R. I believe realtors are central and necessary to every real estate transaction and that you provide an invaluable and important service to the public. I also firmly believe that the survival of our industry depends on adherence to the values outlined in the preamble and the rest of the code of ethics. So I'm going to include a couple of excerpts here and we're going to go through some of the preamble that I believe are relevant to the conversation we're having right now. Let's start with right in the opening paragraph, you know, under all is the land is what it starts with. And it says the, uh, the interest of the nation and its citizens require the highest and best use and the widest distribution of land ownership. Along with a little later, you have a grave or social responsibility and a call to eliminate practices which may damage the public. Clear cooperation speaks directly to every single one of these. By ensuring that every advertised listing is in the MLS, realtors ensure fair and equal access for every member for every listing. They ensure that pricing is determined by the market in arm's length transactions. Above all else, they ensure that all consumers have fair and equal access to every listing as well to protect fair housing. If you engage in any of the things that you can do within the framework of clear cooperation, you are, in my opinion, operating directly against these objectives. But Richard, you're saying, my seller wants this or my seller wants that. Oh, -ho, do I have something for you? Back to the preamble. The bedrock foundation of what makes our industry work is that co cooperation with other real estate professionals promotes the best interests of those who utilize those services. So to that end, Realtors do not attempt to gain any unfair advantage over their competitors. And here's my favorite line. No inducement of profit and no instruction of clients can ever justify departure from these ideals. I think that's pretty clear. <laughs> and then finally, of course, we have the entire basis of the Code of Ethics. Everything in the Code of Ethics is written on the golden rule. You know, whatsoever ye that would that others should do to you, do ye even so to them. We should probably update the modernize that language a bit one of these days, but we'll go with it. So before you keep that property off the market for whatever reason you've cooked up, think to yourself, if I had a buyer who wanted this home, how would I, how would I feel or how would my buyer feel if someone else kept that away from them? Just the golden rule, y'all. Which leads me to a semi-famous quote by a semi-smart person in a video that went semi-viral within the real estate industry. If you don't believe in cooperation, why are you a realtor? Oh, yeah, that was me. I said that. <laughs> Beyond the preamble and lofty ideas, there are real-world consequences within the code of ethics. Broker duties and legal risks that come along with trying to work around clear cooperation as well. Um, if you really, again, if you really want to drill into the history of clear cooperation, the details of why some of these problems you can do within the rule are a really bad idea, I highly recommend watching my clear cooperation video on YouTube. Again, the link is in the chat there. Um, you can either, or you can search for clear cooperation more than just a rule to follow on, on YouTube. But look, y'all, I get it. This market is bonkers, right? Sometimes sellers don't want a million people walking through their home or they don't want their property blasted out across the internet and have unrepresented people queuing up on their doorstep. I'm not blind to the insanity that you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, trust me. But there are other methods and other tools in place that you can use to fulfill those wishes while still making the property available to all other MLS members. For example, you can utilize coming soon. There's no showings allowed in coming soon. It doesn't syndicate out. Other members see it. You can still accept offers. You can also turn off syndication in, in the MLS. There's a broker distribution tab, and you can click a button that says, uh, you know, uh, prevent listing from going out to the internet. So that keeps it only within the MLS and only to uh, members. 
There's all kinds of creative ways to meet a seller's request without running contrary to clear cooperation and the code of ethics. So if a seller wants you to do something and it runs contrary to clear cooperation or these questions start coming up that go outside of, if it's not in the MLS, don't talk about it, um, then you know, talk to your broker, call us here at the MLS. You know, those things matter. Uh, Mary, I, I believe it's from the Bible, isn't it? I'm not, I'm not 100% sure on that, but I think that is where it comes from. She's asking if I know where the golden rule comes from. It could be somewhere else. I might be wrong. Enlighten me if I'm wrong. All right. So we are halfway through. Um, so if you're ready to raise your position on the, on the leading board, grab those phones again. And there's aha slide slash swimless or scan the QR code. I'm just going to kind of assume everybody's in at this point. Gabe, go ahead and pop back over. Looks like everybody's getting in. 106, 108, 113. I know we've been hovering around 140, so I'm going to let it get a little closer to that. I'm loving all the reactions, y'all. Thanks for using those. Makes me feel good to see that you guys are enjoying it. All right. So here we go. It's actually four questions, even though the slide says three questions. First question for this section, uh, question nine overall. Once a listing agreement is in place and the listing is publicly advertised, how long do you have to enter the listing into the MLS? Is it 24 hours, one business day, 48 hours, or two business days? 24 hours, one business day, 48 hours, or two business days? Got 10 seconds left. Five, four, three, two, one. The answer is one business day. Look at that. Yeah, very common misconception that it's 24 hours. The rule specifically actually says one business day. So I'm kind of glad I put that question there. Very, very common misconception. Next up, question 10. Two for this section. Which of the following are acceptable reasons for working around clear cooperation? You can guess what this one's going to be. Instruction from clients, inducement of profit, gaining an unfair advantage, or none of the above. This is another one I'm tracking, and I will, I will so send you compliance notices if you answer this one wrong. <laughs> Not really, but 10 seconds left. Three, two, one. None of the above. There you go. All right. I'm 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 looking you nine people up, I'm telling you. <laughs> Although I'm sure some of you are just being smart. <laughs> Which of the following counts as public advertising? This is another one that has multiple choices. Is it email blast, Facebook posts, sign in yard, telling another member outside of your office? Seller tells their book club or a photographer tells a client. Again, the more you get correct, the more points you get. So even if you only get some of, some of these, you'll still get some points. Got 10 seconds left. Probably should have given you a little more than 30 seconds on this one since it's so many choices, but looks like most people got it in. And this one was a trick question. All six of them. Every one of those counts as public advertising in this case. So if you got all six of them, you got the maximum amount of points there. Good job. All right, last question for this section. Which section of the Code of Ethics did we discuss today that applies to clear cooperation? Is it the preamble, Article 4, Article 7, or Article 12? The preamble, Article 4, Article 7, or Article 12? Got 10 seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Answer is, of course, the preamble. So the, uh, clear, clear cooperation is in the MLS rules. It's actually not codified anywhere within the code of ethics, although I'm sure some other articles talk about, you know, doing the right thing and following where it is. So leaderboard after round three. Andrea has taken the lead. Jean fell down from first down to fourth. Let's do this is holding on to second. Terry, and then that fifth, we have Andrew, 
and then round up top 10, we have Mariah, Susie, Morgan, Kirsten, and Jenna. Let's see, let's go a little bit further here. Katarina and, and Amy are tied for 11th. Amy, you're falling off. What's going on? Uh, you got 13th is Beth, Penny, James, Marsha, AJ, Molly, and Julie to round up the top 20. Uh, more coffee is always the answer, Amy. Always the answer. I always joke that my love language is coffee. <laughs> All right, so jump back over to the presentation for me. So, um, you know what? Speaking of coffee, let's take a 10-minute break here. Let, let's, let's, let's jump in. 9.50 is a nice round number. Uh, uh, head out, get some coffee, take a bio break, whatever you need to do. And let's come back at 10 o'clock because um, I know I could use a little more coffee myself. So see you guys in 10 minutes.
All right, everybody, one minute warning, one minute warning. We'll be back on at 10 o'clock. All right, everybody, 10 o'clock. Let's get started again. So we got that elephant out of the room of clear cooperation, right? Uh, we, we got that elephant out of the way. So let's talk now about some of the most common violations in Southwest MLS. I've actually got six of them lined up for you today. Uh, status overdue, zoning, master bedroom on main, QB or transaction contact info, uh, photos, and lead-based disclosure. So... First up is status overdue, also known as pending past estimated closing date. Uh, this is actually by far our most common failure, uh, normally accounting for about 500 of the 600 violations we process each month. Uh, part of that is because of how automated the process is. Uh, so it catches more than others, but it's still number one. So it's definitely worth talking about. This one's pretty simple to fix. All you have to do is make sure that your estimated closing date is a date in the future. That's it. If a closing is extended or delayed for any reason, just make a mental note to pop into change listing, click on uh, change status pending and update the closing estimated closing date to when you think the listing is going to close. Ideally, this should align with whatever you have on the purchase agreement and your addendums and things like that, or addendments, right? Is that what we're calling them? <laughs> but we also understand that sometimes weird things happen and that's not always possible. So despite providing quite a bit of warning about this rule because of the sheer volume of violations. It's also the most common rule that people are fined for. Uh, to try to, um, so we work pretty hard to try to help people avoid fines. So with this particular rule, four days ahead of the closing date, and then every day up leading up to it, it'll, you'll get emails from Flex warning you, hey, this is coming up. Once the email is in the past, you'll get another email from Data Checker telling you you have 48 hours from that point to fix it. If you just respond to this email with a new date, we'll gladly update it for you. Just reply, please update to and hit send. We'll take care of it, no problem. Um, and then you know, the day after the email and the day before you get a fine, we actually call you as well. Um, so we really try to prevent the fine from happening. We have a very education first stance here. We would rather educate you and help you avoid the fine than any kind of, we only find maybe 10 to 12 a month. Um, but honestly, if after that point, you still haven't updated it or let us know to update it for you, the fine is applied. You know, we, we do everything we can to avoid it, but at a certain point, you're just ignoring us. <laughs> so second most common is zoning. So this rule is either we have detected that something is wrong with your zoning or somebody has let us know that you're wrong, is wrong with your zoning. Um, right now, the only automated process is checking to make sure that the IDO zoning codes are used in Albuquerque, uh, though we also get manual reports for, as, for this as well. Um, I realize there's an issue with that process for anybody who's thinking that right now. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. But know that there are some changes coming, and that's what we're going to talk about later, that are going to expand proactive listing checks to all listings. So the things that we're discussing here are still some of the best practices to start using now, even for your not Albuquerque stuff. Uh, we actually have a few different overlays built into Flex to help you out with this. Uh, if you're looking at the map under quick search, you can click on overlays in the top right, and there's a little drop down you're seeing on the screen here. 
Um, and there's a few options. The example on the screen now is the one for Albuquerque zoning, which if you if you zoom in, it has the zoning for all the various lots in Albuquerque. This is a really a really great resource. Um, uh, yes. Well, Susan, that we won't really get into as MLS. Remember, we're more about data. Uh, what it allows or restricts, you'd want to contact each county tour directly. But uh, one of the things we're doing is um, you'll have links to everything. Like you'll have a link to the, their rule books. You can read through the rule book and figure it out. Um, we're just not going to tell you ourselves for liability reasons. But I'll show you that later. Um, so yeah, so, so this was this is the Albuquerque zoning example. You can see, you know, R1, RMH, MXT, so on and so forth. But just because a property has an Albuquerque address does not necessarily mean it is a city of Albuquerque zoning. The ABQ zoning overlay, which I might rename because it's a little redundant, um, but right now it helps delineate that for you. So if the property is in the red area, uh, it is a city of Albuquerque zoning property. If it's in the green area, it's actually Bernalillo County zoning. There's also a special little carve out for Paradise Hills. It's still blows my mind that an HOA has its own zoning laws, but I'm gonna leave that alone. And then we also included Sandoval County because it's actually there actually are some areas of Albuquerque or, or some areas that have an Albuquerque address that uh, are in Sandoval County. So it could have Sandoval County zoning. Um, uh, Mary asks, what about zoning in East Mountains or areas not in Albuquerque? Uh, if it has an Albuquerque address, it should be in the green. Just you might you can't see on the screen here, but if you scroll over to the right, it should still be green as long as there's an Albuquerque address. If it's not, follow up with me, Mary, and we'll talk more about that specific question. Um, and then finally, of course, the the best resource to use is the GIS interactive maps for each of the counties. Um, so this is this is the example for Valencia County. I wanted to bring them up because they're the one that it's not super obvious which one you need to choose. Um, most of the other counties, it set, actually says zoning and there's a checkbox for it. So you know what you're looking for. In Valencia County, it just has PNZ, which stands for planning and zoning. So leave it to Valencia, right? Um, but, but, that, but their maps are always the most accurate uh, because they have to keep theirs updated. Now, like I was telling uh, Susan a little bit ago, once zoning is moved to the main fields tab instead of the details tab, which we're going to cover later on, there's a little help text button that's going to give you a direct link to all these GIS maps and all of the definitions of what the, uh, the, the county is considered those. So that'll be a really great resource for everybody once it's moved over there. That's just not possible with where it is right now. But again, we'll go into more detail on that later. Next up for most common is master bedroom on main. So the system here is, is a very simple check. If your MBR on main, which is the left side of, of the picture there, is yes, then when you choose the level for your master bedroom on the rooms tab, it should also be main. If it's anything else, it flags it and you need to change it to main. The most common issue is you have yes for master bedroom and then you have lower or first for the level. So although at first glance, this seems like a really obvious fix since lower or first are usually the same as main, that's not always the case. Uh, so we do have to keep these other options available for some of the weirder combinations you can find in our MLS service area. The policy committee did uh, recently discuss this like in depth. I think we spent about 45 minutes on it <laughs> and opted to keep everything as is for the time being. So this next one, I feel like happens just from members moving too fast and not really paying attention. Um, though, of course, if there's anything that anybody can bring up to help us improve this, well, I'm all ears. Please let me know. But basically, this rule just flags if there's a number in the uh, name field or if name is in a number field. So all I can really say here to help avoid it is just pay attention to what you're filling out. Um, I know you're moving fast because this market is insane, but you also don't want to confuse any potential buyers, brokers, or, or just look bad because you have a phone number and a name spot. Um, uh, Rochelle, we're, I'm going to be going over a lot of the changes for zoning a little bit later, so that'll help. Um, Corley, that is actually on the, uh, the policy committee's next agenda. Um, if anybody feel strongly about changing the verbiage from primary bedroom, bedroom or master bedroom to primary bedroom, please shoot me an email. I'd love to get a pulse of how many people feel support that. 
Um, if you're in opposition to it, I'd like to hear you from that as well. So um, thanks for bringing that up, Corley. That, that's a good one because that's certainly come up a few times. And uh, Lisa, that's a good point. Well noted. I'll take a look at that and we'll consider it. So thank you guys for that. Um, so next up is photos. So our, our photos, it's kind of a catch-all for anything dealing with photos for the various rules that are listed here on the right side. Uh, to fix this, you usually just either need to add or remove a photo depending on what rule is being broken. Um, at this point in time, there is only a requirement of one photo. Uh, for a property with a dwelling, you must have at least one photo of the front of the dwelling. For vacant land, you must have a street view of the lot or only if the lot of it is inaccessible by road, you can use a satellite image. Note that this is being changed in the near future. We'll talk more a little more about that later. Some other things to look out for with photos is making sure there's no names, numbers, yard signs, or other contact information in the photos, as well as making sure that all photos are pertinent to the property being sold. There's also some unwritten rules of photos that we won't necessarily fine you for or force you to take them down. Uh, but if your photos contain children or other things that are unprofessional, such as alcohol, guns, gutted animals, I've seen it, <laughs> underwear, et cetera, we may reach out and ask you to take them down as a courtesy. Um, does the front of the home have to be the first photo? No, LaDonna, it does not. That is a great question. Uh, you do have to have at least one image of the front of the dwelling, but it is not required to be the primary photo. Uh, so thank you about that. Uh, photos of the view are, 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 are absolutely fine. They're pertinent to the property. Now, you know, if you, if you are, uh, you know, you have, a, you have the property and you're sending a picture of the view of the mountains that's half a mile away from the property, not so much. That's not really pertinent because what, what the view from the property is, is certainly fine. Um, so because that's the, that's the rule there is that photos are pertinent to the property being sold. And finally, we have the lead-based paint disclosure. Uh, this is what this, this flags when your listing is built in 1978 or older and does not have a lead-based paint disclosure uploaded to listings. Uh, Lisa, I'll talk more about that later. Um, also, coming soon, um, there's some proactive enforcement of documents coming soon as well. So we're also going to be looking for the tax levy disclosure and for PID documents when applicable. So right now, like as of today, um, lead-based paint disclosure and your PID documents are required by MLS rules. Your tax levy documents are actually required by law. It's not in the rules yet because we're working on some proactive enforcement, but it will be once that proactive enforcement is ready. Um, so just a quick sidetrack on that tax levy documents. If you read the rule about that, then, um, or, or the law about that, I'm sorry, it says that you have to require that provide the tax levy disclosure to the buyer before an offer is accepted or, 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 or a, uh, a purchase agreement is even accepted. So even well before the offer. And that does have to be provided by the, uh, the selling broker. The, the, the law specifically says that. So obviously the best place to do that is the MLS. I mean, it's either that or you're having to mail every single person a tax levy disclosure before they send you a offer. So um, the, 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 the MLS is the best place to do that. Tax levy disclosure. Uh, LBP amendum before it's loaded, before you make the listing live, it's actually not possible, Chantel, because that's either required for all listings or no listings. We can't tie it to being 1978. So that's where we're going to be checking for that afterwards. Uh, what about the tax bill is also required to be disclosed? Um, I, I, gotta, I, I know the current and last year taxes are both on there and there's some other items as well. Um, the best thing, thank you for bringing this up, Susan, get it from the county assessor. If you're getting it from the, uh, from the, from the tax collector, it's actually missing one of the required items. So make sure you're getting that data from the tax assessor. Uh, is there a way to get the LBP disclosure to be autofilled? 
uh, LaDonna, that would be a question for InstaNet. So um, talk to Enmar about that. Um, and then Rochelle, like I said, it's a tax levy disclosure. And then, yes, Jenny, thank you for that. If you, on, the, on the main tab of the dashboard, there's an MLS link section there. And we had the link to the assessor there if you're using that one. Um, Beverly, correct. Yep. If you use the levy from the assessor's office, that covers everything you need. If you're doing the tax collector, you have to do both the tax collector and the tax bill. So it's actually less work to do the assessor's office. And uh, Michelle, yeah, that's every, every MLS is allowed to make their own decision on that. So, all right. So back to the documents here. So one thing to go ahead and get in the habit of is what's shown on the right side here. So when you're adding a document, you have two different ways to name the document, right? You can either choose from the drop-down list or there's an option to type in a custom one. I'm, I'm Go ahead and get in the habit of choosing the drop-down list because our um, proactive enforcement is gonna be checking for the name in the drop-down list. If you use the custom name for either the tax levy disclosure, the PID disclosure, or the uh, lead-based paint disclosure, then um, it, it'll, it'll flag you as being incorrect because you didn't choose that. So go ahead and get in that habit when you're uploading those three documents specifically of just use the name from the drop-down list and that'll make it where we don't get any false positives. And how, yes, I found that. There was one county, um, I don't remember which one it was, but you have to actually uh, go to the county and turn in a form that Enmar has created for you. Was it Cibola County, I think, was what it was. Um, but yeah, you can use the, you know, in, in lieu of, uh, yeah, Socorro. So yeah, in, in lieu of the tax levy disclosure, there's another form on Enmar. I don't remember exactly what which one it is, but where you, uh, you sign it, bring it to the uh, county, they sign it, and then you can upload that. So uh, that'll be the, the tax levy disclosure for our MLS purposes. Uh, Rochelle, so the tax levy is supposed to be provided before an offer to purchase is given. So the tax levy is supposed to be based on the listing price, not the purchase price. And so, and then every time you update the listing price, you're supposed to update that tax levy disclosure as well. And Crystal, that's actually something that's on the list for policy to talk about in the near future. So, for, so thanks for that recommendation and keep them coming, yo. I'm loving the interaction here. All right, any other questions on documents? We had a lot going on here, so I wanna make sure I pause for a second and see if anybody's still typing a question. HOA docs, we're not gonna be proactively checking for those yet, um, but they are required. Uh, that's another one that's, re that's required by state statute, I believe. Um, I know our rules say you have to have it. We're just not proactively checking them yet because that gets a little more complicated than the other three. All right. If HOA is yes, I believe so. I'd, I'd have to double check that now. You guys are making me just second, second guess myself, but. And uh, Morris, I'd, I'd have to talk offline. I don't, I don't know the answer to that question right now. I'm not even sure what the difference is. All right. So heading into four out of six here, Thank you, Beverly. Yeah, so HOA is not required by before offer. So that's uh, that's after offer. So that doesn't have to be in the MLS. Thank you for that. So yeah, time to switch back over to the quiz. Everybody get logged back into that. ahaslides.com slash SWMLS. Letting it count up here. Thanks, Bev, for helping us out on these questions. I always love having you to help back me up on these things. <laughs> All right, we're getting up around 130. We've been around 140, so that's looking pretty good. All right. Question one of this section. I agree, Lisa, Bev is the best. True or false, a property with an Albuquerque address could possibly use Bernalillo County zoning. True or false? The true or false questions always get answered pretty quickly. 
15 seconds. 10. And five, three, two, one. That is true. So as we covered, you know, an Albuquerque City address could be Bernalillo Zone Accounting. It could be Paradise Hills Count. It could be even Sandoval in very few cases, but they do exist. Next question, section two, what are the three document types that are required to be uploaded to the MLS? Two of them are required by rule. One is required by law. So you have three total here. Is it the lead-based paint disclosure, the floor pan, the plat map survey, tax levy disclosure, seller's disclosure, or the PID? Even the ones that aren't required here are still good ideas. So don't let that turn you off. As we talked about the data integrity section, just because something isn't required doesn't mean you should skip it. It is still useful for both members and appraisers. Well, appraisers are members as well, so it's redundant. But the three that are required are lead-based paint disclosure, tax levy disclosure, and PID, if it exists, of course. Very good. Good answers there. So the 25 that said seller disclosure, I don't blame you because that's a very good one to have on there. If the field MBR on main has been marked as yes, what should the level be marked for master bedroom on the rooms tab? Is it first, lower, or main? First, lower, or main? <laughs> I agree, Will. Disclose, disclose, disclose. Got 10 seconds. Three, two, one, time's up. It should be marked as main. And yeah, you know, that first seems like a, a, a kind of an obvious thing because in the vast majority of cases, it's a single level home, first floor, main, main floor, but it's, uh, you know, it's not always the case. So make sure you mark main on that rooms tab. Next up. What from the following is against MLS rules to be included in photos? Is it artsy shots of faucets, contact information, arms in mirrors, or raised toilet seats? Only one of these is actually against the rules, although I kind of wish all four were. If anybody is in that, uh, you know, really bad MLS photos group, you know what I'm talking about. Artsy shots of faucets, contact information, arms in mirrors, or raised toilet seats. Of course, the answer is contact information. Those other three, as much as we wish, are not included in the MLS rules. All right, after round four, Andrea holds on to the lead. Let's do this. Is just hanging out there in second place. Uh, you got Terry, Mariah, and Andrew, uh, and Morgan rounding up the top six. Molly, Penny, Beth, and Lisa for the top 10. Uh, Susie is tied for 10th. AJ, Amy, Katerina, Hal, Bethany, Mary, and Sarah. And then uh, Katie, Lisa, Jen, Jerry, and LM rounding out the top 24 there. So good job, everybody. We're seeing lots of participation here. I'm loving it. All right, let's hop back over to the presentation now. All right. So next up, I'm going to cover a few changes that have happened in the last six months, because I really want to make sure everybody understands these, because a few of them were a, a relatively big change in kind of the culture of the MLS here. So I want to talk about those, make sure everybody understands them and, and how everything works. So to start with, we changed the relist policy last year. Um, previously, you could cancel and relist a listing in the MLS by only entering the word relist at the beginning of your LLSO remarks. Uh, the issue with this is that there's lead generation systems that people use that we do not send the LOSO remarks to because it's a private field. So the listing was moved to canceled. It would go out to these lead generation systems and this person would think, hey, this is a canceled listing. Because when a listing is canceled, it's telling everybody in MLS and everybody that uses MLS data that you have terminated your listing agreement, which means that they are free to contact the seller to prospect that listing without violating the code of ethics. So we really wanted to put a stop to that for, you know, both so your sellers aren't getting a ton of calls and just to really bring things back in line with the way uh, the status definitions are supposed to work. Additionally, if you are going to cancel and relist, which 
again, is a bad idea, but you're supposed to have a new listing agreement with a seller as well. Um, but that was also not happening. And people were canceling and relisting just to reset days on market or to get their listing back on the hot sheet. In both cases, this is deceiving the public because it was not, in fact, a new listing. Remember what we talked about with the preamble, anything that harms you know, the public should not be done regardless of inducement of profit or seller direction. So the way the, the new rule works is if you do list a property, relist a property within 30 days, you must provide SMLS staff with the new listing agreement to prove that you do, in fact, have a new listing agreement. Now, the intent of this exception process is not to allow members to continually to, to manipulate days on market in the hot sheet, but rather to allow brokerages the freedom to save a seller. For example, the seller fire, fires their, their associate broker on the 1st, but on the 8th, the qualifying broker is able to convince the seller to list with someone else in the office. So, of course, they sign a new listing agreement, and this allows the office to retain the listing and get it back on the market without having to wait 30 days to relist it. That's the situation that this is built for. If that situation arises, we will allow the new listing number so the new broker can have a fresh start with their own photos and their own check boxes and their own remarks, but we will still fix the days on market to accurately reflect the amount of time the listing has been on the market with that qualifying broker, because you all know in the end, the qualifying broker who, is, who owns the listing. So we will fix the days on market to accurately reflect what it's supposed to be. So that's the new relist policy. We're really trying to make the days on market accurate to, to go back to our, you know, our, our um, data integrity and market statistics conversation. So to kind of keep going on this, if you have, if you still have an active listing agreement on a property, it should never be moved to canceled or expired. If there's something wrong with the listing or the property that requires you to take it off the market, you should use withdrawing. While in withdrawn status, days on market does not continue to count. It's like hitting the pause button on a movie. When the listing goes back on market, it picks up right where it left off. So, because what withdrawn is saying is, hey, this property is not available for showings at this point in time, but I still have a listing agreement on this property, so don't call my seller. That's the, the, the basic definition of what withdrawn means. So let's look at this example. In this case, the property was on the market for four days. It got an offer, went into pending for 25 days, had an issue, took three months to fix it, then went back on the market. In this case, the days on market would still be four days. Um, there's one caveat to this. When you're moving back to, back to active, there's a thing that right now says fall through date that will soon be changed to back on market date then the days on market won't automatically subtract. If that happens though, give us a call and we can fix it for you. Uh, Stella, if you change brokers and get to take your listings, in that case, you there's we actually have a, a transfer listings process where your broker signs off on it and we take the listing and transfer it from the old broker to the new broker and all the days on market and data moves with it. That's the correct way to do that process. Uh, Rochelle, if the listing expires and you make a new listing agreement, if it's within 30 days, the best thing to do is just to reactivate the listing. Uh, you know, the, the, the real best thing to do is just amend the, the thing and just keep it going. Um, but if you do a new listing agreement, we'll either reactivate the existing listing, or if you do a new listing, we're going to fix the days on market either way. Um, relist with a different address. Melanie, don't tell people how to cheat the system. Come on. <laughs> um, what, it, what Melanie just said, don't do, please. That's not cool. Um, all right. So at the same time we made these changes to relist, we also changed the definition of active. Uh, okay. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you. I feel a lot better about that. Yes. People do do, do that. We've, we, we do try to catch it. That's not always possible, but yeah, it, it is, it, it does happen. Unfortunately, we are improving our systems to, to make it better. So if you're getting away with it, you won't get away with it forever. So the definition of active was changed uh, so that if a listing isn't active, it must be available for showings. It is no longer allowable to have do not show or temporarily off-market conditions 
while inactive because in those situations, you should be using withdrawn instead. So if you want to put a property in the MLS on a Wednesday, but you're not going to start showings until an open house on Saturday, you should, you should use coming soon in that situation. Don't put it in active and say in the LOSO remarks, that there's no showings allowed because that is against the rules now. Um, so if that does happen, you will be forced to move the listing to withdrawn. So just to recap there, because I see that happen a lot, you know, you, that's what coming soon is used for is no showings available until a certain date. So you'd enter the listing on Wednesday and you, um, as coming soon and then make it go active the day of the open house. Great question, Susan. This does not mean that you are not allowed to block stuff out. The way we handle it is that the listing has been available for showing. So let's just say you're going to go active on, on Monday. Uh, and the, but the seller for whatever reason is having a barbecue on Thursday and wants no showings on Thursday. You are okay to block out Thursday because the listing has been available for showings at some point. So that's the way we handle that. Uh, I had a list, Rochelle, I had a listing broker deny me to show their listing for five days because she said there was a tenant in the property. Um, so yeah, it is, it is also allowable to put conditions on showings. You know, for things with tenants, I've seen people say, you know, showings are available, but it's contingent on an offer or something along those lines. Um, so the property does have to be available for showings in some way. But if there's conditions like tenants or things like that, that's where it's okay to do that. Uh, the length of time a listing can be in coming soon is 14 days. Thank you, Anita. Great question. Loving you guys' questions. Please keep them coming because you're helping me think of the stuff that I apparently forgot to put in these slides. <laughs> so great, great, great questions. Um, anything else on this read list or definition of active before we move on to the next item? Because these are kind of tied together. Give it a couple seconds for the room to breathe here. Okay, go ahead. Uh, will there ever be a requirement that we should present the seller's name as well as the bank bill that we can sell it on by a certain date range? Uh, yeah, okay. So just in case you guys didn't hear that, Gabe, there was a question from Facebook asking if there'll be a requirement to uh, ask for, to enter the seller's name. That's a tough one. Um, I would lean towards no, just for you know privacy reasons. Maybe the seller doesn't want their information in there. Uh, would be interested to hear what anybody says about that. Uh, you can either you know throw something in chat or or send me an email if you think that's something that should be required. Uh, requirement to enter the seller's name as it is an optional field right now. Um, so that's up to the policy committee. Let's see. Put it in LOSO remarks. Uh, you can get the name of the owner. It would make it easier, Jen Cody says. So yeah, you know, any feedback on that? My email is richard at swmls.com. Really can't get much easier than that. And guys, I um I, I keep a running list for our policy committee. There's a couple people in the policy committee in this room right now that'll tell you. It's a pretty big list and we look at it every month and we talk about the things that come up. Like every single thing you send me does eventually get added on there. So um, safety purposes is not hard to look up. It's not private. It's on the tax bill, seller's name or anyways. So yeah, lot, lot, lots, of, lots of good feedback in here. So I, I'll, I'll go ahead and add this to the policy list and we'll go back and grab the chat later and we can bring that to them and uh, so thanks, guys, for your feedback on that. All right, so let's go ahead and hop over to the next item here, which is fair housing. So at the beginning of 2021, NAR passed a best practice that MLSs must address fair housing in a proactive manner. To that end, SWMLS has added this section to our rules, making it clear that we are committed to compliance with all fair housing laws and requiring members to describe the property, not the people. And we have started proactive enforcement of this through Data Checker as of about 30 days or so, ago or so. To aid in enforcement, there's a word list, and words in that list will be automatically flagged by Data Checker. This list is available in the blog that was explaining this change. Um, 
Gabe, I didn't give you an advance heads up on this, but if you could find that blog and prop, pop that in the chat for us too, please. It was about 30 days ago. Um, I'll get Gabe to find that for you guys. Uh, and, and then we're also going to be adding it on the MLS link section as well. So you have a PDF of that list. Now, despite popular belief, there is no purchase naughty word list by HUD that will get you in immediate trouble if you use them. It just doesn't exist. HUD doesn't have one. They haven't provided one. The entire issue of discriminatory language is extremely nuanced and is more focused on the intent than the use of the actual word. So, Michelle, great question. Who came up with a list of words? So what we did is we used a couple words from a couple of lists that were used by other associations and provided by, you know, by Flex MLS. And we took their list and then we went through it. When I say we, the policy committee created a specific task force for this. And then we went through it and we said, okay, which words in here do we want to keep or not keep? We used data from our MLS. I pulled how many times has this word showed up in our MLS in the entire history of every listing we've ever had. And we used that data as well as considering the local market to determine which words are could have too many false positives and things like that. So there was a lot of work that went into this. Um, and as you can see, there's also some words that are only flagged if they're followed or preceded by words like people, person, community, neighborhood, friendly, area, subdivision, etc. So because you know some of these are, are are okay to use in some in some cases, and we're trying to have the system catch context as best we can without having too many false positives. So, for example, you know, saying something like African design is totally fine, but African community not so much. So, um, you know, we we have the system catching what we can, and then the other thing to remember is that every single one of these is reviewed by swimless staff. It's a person looking at it. So, so far the, the, in the last 30 days, the system has flagged about 20 or so, but not a single one of them was actually a violation. They were all things that were a false positive. So we just ignored it, didn't even send the email out. Um, I see Michelle, you have your hand up. Did you have a question still or did you have it in chat? Okay. All right. Don't worry about it then. Um, so, and then, and then to talk to about if we do send an email, this is, this is what it looks like. It's just a courtesy email. We don't have any kind of fines attached to this. Um, and, the, and, and, and again, the context used is what matters. So we look at the context and if, we, if there's any doubt whatsoever about describing the people instead of a property, we'll send it to you and just say, hey, you know, take a look at this and reconsider it. You can see it says, please read your remarks and make sure that the words are describing the property of the people. If you're describing the property, this notice can be ignored. Um, Andrea, I, I, I think we're gonna, we'll probably blog this afterwards and we'll, we can find a way to include the slide deck on there for you. Um, so yeah, this email is, is simply a reminder to look at it. And, and I'll add this too, during my research and how often you, words were used that could be potential fair housing issues, it was, it was kind of funny to see there was a very deep, very clear decrease in the use of language starting in the late 90s until recently. I obviously didn't read every remark on every listing. There's over 400,000 listings in our MLS. Um, my random sampling didn't really find too many examples that would have been an obvious violation in the last few years. Um, which is why this policy was being created as a very light touch. Um, and then, like I said, it's been active for about 30 days now. And we haven't, we, uh, oh, I'm sorry, we did have to actually send one email. I'm, I'm back, back that up. So, you know, again, that's going to um, describing the property, not the people. So that's how fair housing works. I saw the, most of the conversation here is just kind of been back and forth about the owner name, but there's one question Michelle has here. If you put the owner as on the MLS, does it only show in the private report? And the answer is yes, that does only show up on private. That is a private field. So it does not come up on public. All right. So that is it for the um, recent changes section. So we're going to uh, go hop back over to the uh, quiz now. We're going to see how many people were chatting about the, the things we were talking about, not paying attention to the questions, because I'm back over to the quiz. Go ahead and head over to Gabe. 
Got 94 on, waiting for everybody to get caught up here. Hundred and twenty, getting closer to that magic hundred and forty number we've been hovering around. All right, I see somebody's name is late nineteen hundred. I guess you tried to answer the question <laughs> in the uh, when in the name field there. All right, question one of this section. How many days should a listing be off market, canceled, or expired before being relisted? Is it 15 days, 30 days, 45 days, or 60 days? And, uh, you know, quick note here, it, it, you know, canceled or expired is what matters here. You know, withdrawn does not, is not really considered an off-market status. It's an on-market but unavailable status. So there's a clear, clear difference there. Canceled or expired means you do not have a listing agreement anymore. Withdrawn means you do. The answer is 30 days. Very good, the majority of you guys got that there. All right, second question for this section. Do days on market continue to count while a listing is in withdrawn status? So a simple yes or no. Do days on market continue to count while a listing is in withdrawn status? Fifteen seconds. Ten. Just about everybody's answered. Three, two, one. Time's up. No, days on market do not continue to count while a listing is in withdrawn status. Great job, everybody. All right, question 19 overall, question three for this section. Your seller asks for no showings until after an open house on Saturday, but you wants to put your yard, sign in the yard on Monday. What should you do? Should you enter the listing as coming soon, set the open house for Saturday and set the listing to go active on Saturday? Enter the listing as active on Monday, put notes in the LOSO remarks that there's no showings until Saturday, or put your sign in the yard, don't put it in the MLS and hope nobody catches you. There's one very obvious wrong answer here, y'all. Don't disappoint. <laughs> Five seconds, three, two, one. Enter the listing is coming soon. Set the open house for Saturday and set the listing to go live at, on Saturday. Very good. Thank you all for not choosing the obvious wrong answer. And the 24 of you that yeah, it is not allowed anymore. So you so make sure you're using coming soon or something or, or withdraw it if that's the case. Last question for this section, true or false? If you fall into a special exception to relist within 30 days, your DOM will be reset back to zero. So this is talking about that special exception that I talked about where if a listing is changing associate brokers, but is staying within the same qualifying broker, uh, that's where you are allowed to do within 30 days and send us that, that uh, listing agreement. So if you fall into that, uh, true or false that we will reset your days on market back to zero. And that uh, cancer is false. In that situation, we will carry over the days on market because it still belongs to the same qualifying broker. So half and half there, that might change the leaderboards a little bit. Let's see how it did. Terry moves up into number one. Adrian drops, Andrea drops to two. Let's do this was kicked out of second place where they've been very comfortable so far. Penny, Mariah, Morgan for the top six. Molly, Beth, Katerina, and Susie round out the top 10. LM, AJ, Andrew, Lisa, Sarah, top 15. Mary, Jen, Jerry, and Bethany and uh, for the top 19. I'm noticing there's not a whole lot of ties left here. The time and the amount of questions we're doing is starting to separate everybody. And then Susan, Carrie, Juanita, and Juliet in the top 24. Uh, fun fact here, I found out that, uh, that Adrian is actually participating and he's not even in the top 25. I'm going to shame him later. <laughs> All right, hopping back over to the presentation now. And you know what? Actually, real quickly, I need to rewind for a second because... When we took our break, uh, Melody came by and reminded me that uh, cooperation is actually part of the code of ethics. I'm sorry I forgot to mention this while we were talking about clear cooperation, but Article 3 reads, 
Realtors shall cooperate with other brokers except when co cooperation is not in the client's best interest. So co co cooperation is part of the code of ethics. That's another thing to add on to our discussion we had earlier there. All right, last section. We're going to cover some of the upcoming changes in the MLS that are still being worked on. So we talked about minimum photos earlier, right? And this is still coming. Uh, th th so for all residential resale li listings, we're going to require a photo of the living room, kitchen, bathrooms based on the number, the exterior front, and the backyard. There are a couple exceptions for either a tenant-occupied properties, substandard, or the seller request on the listing agreement to not enter photos. So this policy is intended to raise the floor is what we're talking about on the quality of our MLS data. And it actually includes some pretty neat industry first with technology, which is why it's delayed, which I'll talk about later. Before I get into that nerdy stuff, you know, this, this is the rule here. And note that there should be at least one of each bathroom. So if it's a one bathroom home, there's actually, there's going to be five required photos. If there's a two bathroom home, you'll have six required photos, et cetera. And this rule does apply to all statuses, including sold. So with this rule, you cannot remove all of your photos after the listing is sold. I'll address seller privacy in a moment, I promise. But um, the purpose of this was, again, trying to make it where every listing in our MLS should be available and useful as a... Um, a CMA or for an appraiser. And yeah, Lisa, I'm going to talk about privacy in a moment. Um, so like I said, it does only apply to the residential property type. It does only apply to um, resale. And we do have those exceptions in there for tenant occupied or substandard. Um, and, and, and Katerina, I, I, we beat that around quite a bit. And this word substandard was left a little vague on purpose because if a house is unsafe to enter to get those, we, as the MLS, we don't really want to force anybody into it. And, you know, as I said, you know, this is an industry first. Nobody in the industry has done this before. So we're going to learn some lessons. You know, there's going to be a little bit of throw it at the wall and see what sticks on this. Um, so, you know, these rules can be tweaked over time. So, you know, we're, we're going to give this a shot. We're going to see how it goes. We may have more exceptions. We may have less exceptions. We just got to see how it works out once it hits the real world. So um, the thing to remember here is that this is not a reactive only rule. Our compliance system data checker is going to be proactively checking every listing in the MLS by using artificial intelligence from a company called RESTB.AI. RESTB.AI is a computer vision software that can look at a photo and can tell data checker what it is a photo of. Here are four examples showing front of house kitchen, living room, and bathroom. No other MLS in the country is utilizing RESPI technology in this manner. Your Southwest MLS Board of Directors, Committees, and staff are leading this charge. Um, another thing that RESPI does, just to talk about it real quickly, is it will actually auto-detect things like contact information or signs in photos. That's what most people use it for. We're going to have that too, but this cool piece, we're the first. So I'm pretty proud of that. Now, I promise to talk about privacy. One of the reasons for this rules creation was to prevent members from deleting all their photos off a listing when moved into sold. And the problem with this practice is it makes listings completely useless for the creation of CMAs, BPOs, appraisals, et cetera. If two homes are next door to each other and one sells for $50,000 more, but you can't see any of the photos, how are you supposed to tell what caused that difference? Swimless members need to be able to up to see upgrades, finishes, fixtures, and features that can only be seen in photos. The five items chosen here for the minimum by the policy committee and board of directors were based on photos that would be most likely to show these upgrades while also keeping the number of photos to a minimum so that you can't see the entire layout of the home. In fact, only three of the requirements are of the interior of the phone, home at all the bathrooms, the living room, and the kitchen. Additionally, based on our IDX rules and agreements, the majority of websites and the public already automatically take down photos once a listing is sold. Uh, this is my home, purchased in April of last year, pulled up on Zillow, HomeSnap, Homes.com, and Trulia. 
The listing agent did not remove any photos of listing and neither I nor her did anything to contact any of these companies and ask them to take the photos down. And as you can see, the only photo available on all four of these is the Google Street View. The one exception to this is Realtor.com and either the listing agent or the consumer can contact them directly to have photos removed. Uh, Susan, uh, during, there's not an exception for that right now, but we have discussed it. It's one of those we're going to kind of see how it goes. Um, Michelle, uh, very likely, yeah, we had, we, we had that discussion at the policy committee as well, because the way the policy committee looked at it, and I agree with them, is if you're entering a listing as comp only, it needs to actually be useful as a comp. You know, if, if you're entering a listing as comp only and it's not useful as a comp, then what are we doing it for, Right. So yes, I, I, that, that very likely will be part of this. But again, it's one of those where we have to let it hit the real world and you know, changes can happen. So, all right. Another option for, you know, it, for seller or buyer privacy with photos, it's actually already built into Flex as there's this option that says mark private while off market. So the way that works is if you select a photo when you're in the photos tab, that, that red box will pop up. And you can enact it at any time, even while the home, even while the, the home is active. And once the property moves into an off-market status, so it's sold or canceled or expired, it will automatically remove the photos from the data feed. And any website who is using the photos, including realtor.com, is prompted to take the photos down. So, but but it, it, this keeps the photos available to members within the MLS. So and this is where it's a good thing, you know, with people who are worried about security and privacy and things like that, it might be a good thing to remind your, your seller that everyone who has access in the MLS is licensed in the state of New Mexico, and that licensing process includes background checks and fingerprinting. So, you know, it, leaving the photos available to the membership within the MLS is really not a worthy excuse to worry about security or privacy. Um, and then also remind your sellers on your listing agreements, uh, they have to authorize that you as the broker are required to adhere to all MLS rules and regulations. It's on your listing agreement that they agree to that. <laughs> so you may not remove those required photos. Um, as mentioned previously, only three of the requirements of the interior of the home, because like I said, we, we really did try to balance that privacy versus useful data. And quite frankly, photo, the, the, the photos of bathrooms are not going to show you anything about a layout of a home. You usually take it from the hallway looking into the bathroom. So all you know is a bathroom exists. Kitchen, you know, you're usually looking at the countertops or the stove. Again, not showing you much of the layout. And then most valuables are not kept in a living room. So we really do believe that we've struck the right balance between uh, privacy and these minimum photos here. All right. And then this one is the last one is changes to zoning. Um, starting to run out of time. So I'm going to run through this pretty quickly. So we have time for our last quiz. Uh, this this section is an absolute pain, right? I mean, I, I, I normally ask people to raise their hand of anybody who loves this, but the answer is always literally nobody. <laughs> and then on top of that, so, or, so you have issues where, you know, all these options are in here. Not all of them apply to your property. We don't even have all the options for uh, zoning for the entire state. Like if you have something that's outside of our five counties, like you have something in Donna on a county, you know, the, their zoning options are not even available on here. Um, on top of that, like I was saying, if a property has an Albuquerque address, but it's in that Bernalillo County zoning area, and you click the correct thing, you get flagged by Data Checker because Data Checker is thinking you have to pick an IDO, but that's not true. So it causes compliance issues for us too, where we have these false positives, where we have to work on it and say, oh no, you can leave it like this and we'll ignore it. And it just creates more work. So this is equally painful for staff. Um, so here's the change. Zoning is going to be moved over to the main fields tab instead. And here we can limit the options that are available in the drop down for you based on what city you chose. So, Adrian, Kenna, and I painstakingly went through, we looked up every single county of our five counties, compared them with the cities, everything that should or shouldn't be available. Um, and, and it's going to limit it to just that list. Now, some lists are still going to be kind of long. As we've talked about, 
Albuquerque, you know, you can have the IDO zoning, the Bernalillo County zoning, the Paradise Hill zoning, and the Sandoval, Sandoval County zoning. So all those are still going to be available in the list. But if you get it wrong, we will have data checker on the backside be able to catch it. So there we, we can combine, you know, depending on the location it is, it'll actually use that ABQ zoning map and say, okay, which one of these colors is it in and look for the right one. And it'll help us narrow it down for you. Uh, great question, Jen. Uh, if, it's, if it's not one of our five main counties, there will actually be a out of area option for zoning now. You know, we don't really want to have an out of area option in that details list because it just becomes a default option of people who get too lazy to look it up. Um, so there is going to be an out of area option for ones that are outside of our five counties. Um, other examples, uh, Moriarty address, it has to have actually zoning options for both Santa Fe and Torrance County. Um, so like I said, data checker has been set up to double check that on the backside for you uh, to make sure you picked an available option. So um, it's limiting the list as much as we can. To the extent that it can't, data checker is going to help catch it, and it's going to be able to give us quick answers to you of what the right thing is going to be. So we're really going to be working on this. And yeah, LaDonna, we, we literally looked up every single city and its city borders for every single one of our five counties. And yeah, Edgewood goes over multiple counties as well. So, um, and Patty agreed. It's, it's, let's be honest, zoning is an absolute mess right now. And then Lisa, the auto population, once this is moved over into main fields, that is something that we can pursue. I'm not entirely sure it's possible because I'm not sure if Remind gets that data for every county, uh, but it is something to consider for the future. So that's another one of the reasons of moving this over to main fields because it builds on us for more options in the future. So fingers crossed, maybe one day we'll see how it goes. Um, so, and then... If you're keeping tabs at home, uh, you'll probably recall that the minimum photo changes and, and zoning changes have been coming soon for about six months now. Um, first off, paying enough, pay, thank you for paying enough attention to notice. But finding developers that is a big problem in the MLS industry right now. Um, really, it's a problem everywhere. Uh, finding people who are programmers and can do this stuff it, is incredibly difficult because right now, uh, developers are... Um, essentially able to name their price and their working conditions. So they're changing companies quite a bit. And every time a developer leaves or comes on to, new to a company, they have to figure out where they are in the project and it just causes delays. So we will get there, I promise. I have frequent check-ins with all of our vendors for updates. Just be patient with us a little bit longer. This kind of stuff is coming because I know you're all very excited for it. All right, it's the final countdown, last round. Cheesy 80s joke. Um, the last round, this is where heroes are made, or if you're a Dolphins fan like me, this is usually where you realize your team is not going to playoffs. <laughs> Grab your phones, head back over to AHA Slides, or scan that QR code, and let's get ready to play the last round and see who comes out on top. All right, we got 120. We are running out of time, so I'm not going to give it too long here. 130 is close enough. All right, question 21, first one of this section. What tab on the ad listing screen will zoning be found on once all of the updates have been completed? Is it going to be in the address tab, the main fields tab, the details tab, or the rooms tab? 20 seconds. 15 seconds. 10. Five. Thanks, Patrick. I'm glad you enjoyed the interactiveness. It's got, you got to make these things fun on Zoom, right? Time's up. It will be on the main fields tab in the future. Very good. Next question. Which of the following photos will not be required when, you get, when the minimum photos rule goes into effect? Which one is not required? The front of the house, the kitchen, the backyard, the living room, or the dining room? And one thing, you know, it's, it's not a bad idea to go ahead and start doing this now. Again, get in the habit. This is still a best practice. It may not be enforced right now. It may not be a rule right now, but do the right thing, y'all. You know, like keep the data valuable for our appraisers. Five seconds. Three, two, one. The dining room will not be required. The backyard actually is a required field. Uh, the policy was talking about that and 
uh, and, and appraisers need it as well. They actually have to have a photo of the back of the structure. So we're kind of hoping some of the backyard will include back of structure for the appraisers. Question 23, what is the name of the underlying computer vision AI product that Swimless will be proactively using to check photos? This is probably the hardest question of the whole thing. So I think I only mentioned it twice. Is it OpenCV, Viso Suite, RESTB.AI, or MATLAB? Computer vision artificial intelligence product that Southwest MLS will be using to proactively check photos. I figure this is going to be the one that's going to kind of shake the leaderboard up at the end here. We got one last question, then we'll wrap. Time's up. Resb.ai. Good job. All right, everybody. Last question, then we'll see what the leaderboard is. True or false, the minimum photo policy will only apply to residential resale properties. True or false? This one's a bit of a softball to wrap it up. After this, we'll do the leaderboard, and I literally have one more slide for you. So I'm going to wrap up on time here. 10 seconds. That is true. It does only apply to residential resale properties to start with. It may be expanded as we, uh, as we work on it, but so let's see here. Andrea snuck in at the last second here. Been hanging out around third place most of the time, but snuck in at the last second and took it from Terry. Uh, so Andrea, good job with first place there. Terry, Penny, Molly, and Lisa rounded out the top, the top five. LM, Mariah, let's do this. Mary and Susie round out the top 10. Thanks, everybody. Uh, Gabe, if you'll pop back over to the, to the uh, presentation here, we'll wrap up. That's about all we have for today. One last thing. I'd lose my nerd card today if I didn't make at least one Star Wars Day reference. May the fourth be with you all. <laughs> uh, but seriously, myself, Adrian, and Kenna are always available to answer any questions you may have. We're also wide open for feedback, concerns, congestions, uh, suggestions, comments, requests, feature enhancements for any of our products or rules. If there's anything we can do to, to work or make your life easier, please let us know. And contact information is here on the screen. Awesome class, everybody. Thank you so much for the interaction. This was a lot of fun. And just everybody just have an amazing day. Thank you. Have a good day.